Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Cliff May, FDD's founder and president. Today's discussion comes as Russia continues to build up troops along Ukraine's borders. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki predicted last week that a Russian invasion of Ukraine is imminent. Of course, this would be a further invasion. Russian forces seized Crimea in 2014. Since that time, Russian forces and proxies also have been engaging in a separatist conflict in Donbass, eastern Ukraine. However, as I noted in my column this week in the Washington Times, unless your name is Vladimir Putin, you don't really know where the Russian troops and tanks are gonna cross Ukraine's borders one day soon. And even if your name is Vladimir Putin, you may be uncertain. It's an autocrat's prerogative to change his mind. What we do know is that if Putin wins, it's not only Ukraine that loses. The geopolitical implications are consequential and dire. Among the most foundational rules of the current world order, borders are not to be erased by military force, and international commitments are to be honored. Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange for a guarantee of its independence and sovereignty. That commitment, the Budapest Memorandum, was signed by the U.S., the U.K., and yes, by Russia. A key player often missing from the analysis is Turkey, a NATO member. Turkey supplies drones to Ukraine, but also, increasingly, is Putin's partner. I'd argue that both Erdogan and Putin seek to reestablish their nation's lost empires and profoundly alter the post-World War II and post-Cold War international order. Beijing wants the same, by the way. We have experts here today to discuss the evolving Turkish-Russian relationship and the policy options for the US, NATO, and the EU. Anna Borshchevskaya is a senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, focusing on Russian policy in the Middle East. She also serves as a contributor to Oxford Analytica and a fellow at the European Foundation for Democracy. Sinan Gidede is an expert on Turkish domestic politics and foreign policy and an associate professor of national security studies at Marine Corps University. We're also pleased to have Sinan as a member of the Board of Advisors for FDD's Turkey program. My colleague John Hardy is a research manager and a research analyst at FDD. His research focuses on Russian foreign and security policy, U.S. policy toward Russia and the post-Soviet space, and transatlantic relations. And finally, today's conversation will be moderated by Ikon Erdemir, Senior Director of FDD's Turkey Program. Ikon previously served as a member of the Turkish Parliament, including on the EU-Turkey Joint Parliamentary Committee. As you may already know, FDD is a nonpartisan research institute exclusively focused on national security, and foreign policy. FDD is a source for timely research, analysis, and policy options. Today's program is part of FDD's Turkey program, which seeks to inform policymakers and the American public about the dangerous policies pursued by President Erdogan's Islamist-rooted Justice and Development Party. FDD takes no foreign government or foreign corporate money. We never have, we never will. For more information on our work, we encourage you to visit our website, fdd.org. You can follow us on Twitter as well. That's just at FDD. So thanks again for joining us for this important and timely conversation. Icon, over to you. Thank you, Cliff, for that impactful introduction and for your important leadership on this issue. And thank you again for joining us today. I'm Icon Erdemir, Senior Director of FDD's Turkey Program. Cliff's remarks set the stage well on the dire consequences for the United States if we do not act soon to deter Russian aggression along Ukraine's borders. Let's move forward with my first round of questions to our stellar lineup of panelists. Anna, Cliff just said, quote, unless your name is Vladimir Putin, you don't know whether Russian troops are going to invade Ukraine, unquote. And he added, quote, even if your name is Vladimir Putin, you may be uncertain. It's an autocrat's prerogative to change his mind, unquote. Nevertheless, let me ask you the million dollar question. What is Putin's game plan in Ukraine? To make it more challenging, what is Putin's game plan with Erdogan? How does Putin manage to juggle these two potentially conflicting game plans? Thank you very much, uh, Icon. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Um, to the extent that we can divine Putin's game plan, it is, uh, it is the following. It is to use all elements of state power 
including coercion and uh, really compellants, um, to uh, force the West into a, a dialogue on its terms and make concessions. Um, and this is uh, this is this is far bigger than Ukraine. The issue really is 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 not Ukraine. Um, this is about a revision of the post Cold War world order. This is ultimately about expelling the United States from Europe. It is about fundamentally changing um, the European security architecture. And uh, Ukraine is part of it, but really this is much bigger. Um, uh, and uh, when it comes to um, uh, the second part of your question, uh, Putin's game plan for Erdogan, uh, if you look at how Putin has set up the bilateral relationship uh, with uh, Erdogan since, since the two of them essentially came to power at the same time, um, it, it was, it's, it's a disbalanced relationship. It's a relationship where Putin has more leverage over Erdogan than the other way around in multiple um, theaters. And you really have to look at this across multiple theaters uh, rather than one. Um, uh, and, uh, and frankly, I think this is something that Erdogan may have realized a little bit too late. Um, uh, certainly, um, uh, Russia is, does not appear to be happy with uh, the, the um, uh, military technical relationship uh, that Ankara has developed with, with Ukraine, as well as uh, Erdogan's um, involvement with Crimean Tatars. Um, the issue really is what pressure Putin is ultimately going to use, and that again goes back uh, to who has more leverage over whom. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Sinan, let me now turn over to you. Over the last few years, uh, we have seen Erdogan play a spoiler role within NATO to water down the transatlantic alliance's punitive action and rhetoric targeting Russia. Turkey remains the only NATO member state to be slapped with US sanctions under the Countering America's Adversities Through Sanctions Act for its purchase of the S-400 air defense system from Russia. Nevertheless, some analysts in Washington argue that Turkey is an important counterweight against Russia in NATO's southeast flank, and for that reason, the United States should take a more appeasing tone. Is Erdogan's Turkey still the bulwark against Russia the way it used to be during the Cold War? What is Erdogan's game plan with Putin? Uh, likewise, with all colleagues, and thank you to I, uh, Icon and, uh, and my colleagues here at FTD, and uh, thank you for organizing this, um, this, this, this timely sort of gathering once again. I wish we could have done it in person, but here we are. Um, good questions. Um, I, I just saw before coming online today that President Erdogan is uh, scheduled to go travel to Ukraine in, a, in, in the very near future to meet with his Ukrainian counterpart, which does sort of escalate the main question of what you just asked me. Um, what is Erdogan's game in terms of what is he signaling by traveling to Ukraine in the next few days? Um, it seems to suggest that he would probably like to um, reiterate and reinvent and underscore his value to, um, or his potential value to NATO, the United States and all other concerned parties in Europe, simply by saying, I have some demands. Um, I think I've been treated badly in the last few years. Uh, we still have a lot of convergence and therefore it would behoove you to essentially pay attention to uh, what, I, what I can do. Um, that being said, um, I think Erdogan is an in, in a very uncomfortably precarious position vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russian actions or proposed Russian actions in Ukraine. Um, yes, we still don't know the end game of what Putin is proposing or seeking to achieve in Ukraine, uh, but it's also the case that Turkey is not entirely happy with uh, the proposed Russian action. Not, I don't think it necessarily has any strong bearing with the treatment of Crimean Tatars or any sort of cultural um, sort of uh, attributes that people may want to ascribe. That sort of bridge was crossed a long time ago with the invasion of Crimea in 2014, and Turkey's response was just basically to ignore it. But at this point, there is one element I, that I'm trying to pay attention to, which has not been paid a a considerable amount of attention in this area is what happens to the future of the Black Sea. Uh, one of the main concerns of all the states along the Black Sea littoral is the proposed Russian naval buildup, right? Uh, and what that would mean for European and, and, and basically Caucasus security, uh, particularly to other vulnerable countries in the region, such as Georgia. Um, you know, we, NATO has not been too vigilant 
not least of all the United States, because the United States has been absent from the region for a while in any substantive manner, but we've been particularly absent in terms of Russian naval buildup and capabilities build up in the Black Sea, which is, pro which is going ahead with full steam. And this is something, uh, or na Russian naval dominance is something that they never had even during the Cold War, but this could actually become a reality at this point, given their sort of domination of the Crimea. Uh, and if they do succeed in building that land bridge uh, or corridor connecting uh, Crimea and Russian mainland, then we, ha we have ourselves a problem, not to mention the Russian naval basing in Latakia that's also in the Medi Eastern Mediterranean. So the Turks are not happy about this. And I don't think Erdogan is in a position where he would like to see the continued naval buildup and dominance of the Russian Navy in the Black Sea that goes uncontested. This is something that I don't think even he wants, even in his craziest dreams. But he is in a difficult position, um, mainly because he may not necessarily be able to deter uh, Russian actions in one way or another, um, simply because he learned a hard lesson in November 2015, after shooting down the Russian fighter jet, that you know Vladimir Putin does not actually have to hit back Turkey militarily, but can make his life extremely difficult um, by slapping on a variety of punitive economic measures or sanctions, if you want to call them, which would cripple the Turkish economy, which it did then, uh, resulting in a full apology by Erdogan to Putin. But in this economic climate that Turkey is going through, any strong rebuke of Russian actions by Erdogan uh, I think would be met by even stronger reactions that would seriously harm the already fragile and beleaguered Turkish economy. So um, it's unclear what Erdogan's options are, um, I think, simply because I don't think he's, 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 he would be acting from a position of strength. Thank you, Sinan. And now let me turn to John. John, as you and I, together with Sinan, explained in our recent FTD monograph, collusion or collision, Turkey-Russia relations under Erdogan and Putin, bilateral relations between Ankara and Moscow are extremely complex. Can you walk us through the areas where Putin and Erdogan have found common ground to join forces over the last two decades in diplomacy, defense, and energy? Right, thanks, Aikan. Great to be with you. Um, as you say, uh, despite centuries of war, enduring mutual suspicions, and these days increasing competition across a range of theaters, uh, Russia and Turkey really have achieved close, if transactional, uh, cooperation in the economic, diplomatic, and even security spheres. So historically, uh, since the late Cold War era, economic and particularly energy cooperation uh, was the main driver, as well as a buffer against geopolitical tensions. Uh, Turkey is dependent on Russian gas, and Turkey is a, an important gas export market for Russia. Um, the two powers um, had the Blue Stream um, uh, gas pipeline come, on, come online in 2003. Uh, more recently in 2020, uh, they inaugurated the $11 billion Turk Stream pipeline. And they also have a $20 billion nuclear power plant. Uh, as Sinan mentioned, uh, Russia is a top provider, I'm sorry, a top market for uh, Turkish agricultural products and construction contracts. Russia is also a top provider of tourists uh, to Turkey, which are all important uh, revenue streams for Turkey's beleaguered economy. Um, the second key, key factor is really antipathy uh, toward the West. Uh, for Erdogan, ties with Russia facilitate independence from the West. And then for Putin, Turkey's willingness to break with Washington and with other NATO allies really meshes well with Moscow's uh, efforts to erode US influence and undermine the transatlantic alliance. Um, that Turkey's uh, S-400 purchase, uh, which is inc uh, inc incompatible, as we know, with NATO systems uh, is really a key example here. Um, and then finally, uh, I think both Russia and Turkey recognize that you know, even when they, where they compete, um, they can achieve more uh, through cooperation than they can otherwise. Um, of course, they still compete, but you know, across a range of theaters, uh, Syria, Libya, or the Caucasus, um, we've seen um, them reach negotiated outcomes that get their interests uh, further than, than where they would otherwise. Um, Syria is, is really the key example here. Uh, the basic bargain was that Russia um, would enable Turkey to conduct operations against the Kurds to prevent the emergence of a, a Kurdish statelet on Turkey's border. And then Turkey in turn facilitated deals with the Syrian opposition uh, that ultimately enabled a return of Assad regime control uh, in various areas across Syria. I'll stop there. Thank you, John. And Sinan, let me 
get back to you here. If Erdogan, as most opinion polls predict, loses Turkey's 2023 presidential and parliamentary elections, what is your prediction about the foreign and security policy course a post-Erdogan Turkey would take vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Can Turkey pivot away from Russia and come back under NATO's fold once again? Good question, uh, I can. Um, I'm going to preface this by sort of pushing back against the uh, the sort of recent uh, commentary on sort of mainstream, sorry, not mainstream, but independent Turkish media and analytical thinking that that that, that some a lot of us follow in, in the Turkish spheres, such as the Mediascopes of this world or the or the Ahval uh, podcasts, and um, where there is this sort of heightened. Um, concentration of what's going to happen after Erdogan should he lose you know the upcoming presidential and parliamentary elections specifically if they sort of are held on time in June 2023 at the latest um reason being is I think this is too premature to go down this road I still think this is and this sort of you know pushback is sort of sometimes accused of being the pessimist route which then is uh, predicated upon sort of giving Erdogan increased lifeblood uh because there are so many pessimists around in terms of um, not being able to see, uh, you know, what, what happens to Turkey after Erdogan. Uh, and I say that because, you know, the literature is clear on this. Authoritarian regimes, whilst they are fragile and whilst they do not necessarily last, there are good case examples where they do continue uh, despite very, very heavy negative economic consequences and unpopularity of leaders. There are numerous literate examples of this, not least of all Venezuela, uh, but also uh, uh, Zimbabwe under um, Robert Mugabe. And there is no guarantee that Erdogan, should he lose an election upcoming, that he will transition power over. Uh, and, 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 I, and, and the pushback against that is typically that um, he lost Istanbul, Ankara, and a number of other cities in the, uh, the previous municipal elections in Turkey. That is true. And if, wish, if, wish, you know, if, if he could have had his wish, uh, he may he may have not sort of uh, let those trans uh, power transitions in the municipalities happen, but let me let's underline one thing here: losing Istanbul or Ankara or any other city is not Erdogan losing national power or the presidency. And what I extrapolate from this um, is to suggest that we should not underestimate the Assad-like potential that Erdogan ma maintains in his grip to hold on to power because as, as you and I or some other people have been saying, this has been about survival for a very, very long time. And that is number one. So I think a lot of these sort of, uh, the Turkish perspective that concentrates on he's cooked, he's done, uh, the economy's terrible, people are starving, the, the, the exchange rate is collapsing. He cannot hold on to power. I would just like to draw attention, even if it's not apples to apples of how certain autocrats hold on to power not least of all Bashar al-Assad, going back to the early 2010s. This is not outside of the scope of Erdogan's potential or ability to carry out, should he wish to do so, not to mention all of the paramilitary and conventional military and law enforcement measures that he maintains under his skin uh, to con continue his survival. So that would be my first point. Let's not bet against the house, uh, even though it may be depressing or pessimistic. This has the potential to continue. Now, if it is the case that the regime is not able to survive, or there is this, we can start talking about the post Erdogan phase, what the foreign policy arena will look like. Again, we should be cautious um, in terms of uh, nostalgia thinking that Turkey will essentially sort of thaw out from its sort of authoritarian grip of Erdogan and re-engage in a positive manner with all sorts of Western partners, allies and institutions, because I don't think that rosy scenario is likely to play out at least in the short term. Um, the entire edifice of the foreign ministry, for the most part in senior positions, even if at the ambassadorial levels, has been housed and occupied now by ideologues. The entire integrity of these of, of the foreign policy establishment has not only been gutted, but it's been filled by lackluster ideologues or former diplomats who came from the actual professional background have thrown in their sort of lot with the government or the Erdogan sort of perspective and become quote unquote, I would say trolls on behalf of the regime. Expecting them to sort of come out of this shell is, is, is unrealistic in the short term. But furthermore, the influence of the military um, under sort of Erdogan's revamping since the coup attempt and the staffing of senior officers and whatnot has placed what a lot of you um, have correctly observed as 
a new ideological tint on the aspirations of where Turkey wants to play in the world, this so-called Eurasianist track, right? That Turkey should, you know, question its 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 anchor uh, in 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 you know with the West and its role within the United States and and Europe, and absolutely push back against what they perceive to be unfair demands. So if it's the Osman Kavala and Council of Europe sort of decision to sort of really take Turkey to task for breach of you know um, court rulings for imprisoning human rights uh, 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 activists then I think there's a considerable pressure upon the Turkish foreign policy establishment to say, no, we're not going to follow any of these unfair, quote unquote, imperialist Western Soros led impositions. Um, I suspect uh, also any of the opposition parties that are in parliament right now, now, especially of the ones such as Ahmed Davutoglu, the former foreign minister and prime minister of Turkey that was under Erdogan, but also Ali Babajan and Meral Akşener's party who are in opposition, right? These entities are not what I would consider to be the bastions of liberal internationalism as espoused by Turkey's former counterparts in the late 90s, such as Ismail Cem or Kemal Dervish, or uh, sort of a much more sort of engaged, um, liberally engaged sort of uh, foreign policy sort of ideals. Um, so in the short term, I think it's bleak, although I think some of the, you know, if, if we have to put some, if there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel, I think there are there would be some immediate openings for Turkey to reestablish and rekindle its um, institutional linkages with some core partners and allies. One area that I think should, would be ripe for this, if there is a change of government in Turkey, especially if the AKP and Erdogan are out for good, would be in the realm of economics. Right, Turkey is in dire need of uh, sustainable uh, and long-lasting uh, financial assistance at this point in time. Um, some analysts, I think, Icon, you wrote about this, uh, or you spoke about this recently, which I heard, um, a bailout package that would stabilize the Turkish economy would at this point would be realistic uh, if the IMF was to get involved to the tune of 100 to $150 billion, which is twice what Argentina received, and it would be the far largest bailout in, 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 in the IMF's history, right? I think pol you know, policymakers in Turkey in the foreign policy realm would probably like to re-engage at some level with international creditor institutions, because uh, what Erdogan is doing is relying on extracurricular or uh, sort of um, non-conventional means of securing capital or foreign currency to shore up its economy. And that is simply unsustainable. Even though the IMF and World Bank comes with some pretty hefty penalties and uh, price tags and um, economic jurisprudence and uh, running a tight ship as far as corruption and whatnot is concerned, that is only doable if Erdogan is out of the picture. So. Thank you, Sinan, for that extra dose of pessimism in an already gloomy uh, arena. Let me turn to John. So John, uh, uh, what leverage does Putin have over Turkey and Erdogan uh, until 2023, or if we take Sinan's word for it, for possibly a much longer time? And in return, what leverage does Erdogan have over Putin? Thanks, Icon. Well, if, if studying Russia has taught me one thing, uh, pessimism is usually warranted. So I think I, I will take Sinan's word for it. Um, anyways, in terms of uh, leverage that Putin has, um, as Sinan and I mentioned in our remarks earlier, um, Russia is, is a key market for you know, agricultural products, uh, construction contracts, and the like. So. Um, we could see a reprisal of the 2015 Russian sanctions against Turkey, um, the so-called tomato wars, basically cutting off uh, access for Turkish products, um, you know, cracking down on Turkish um, uh, 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 construction companies in Russia. Um, Syria is another key point of leverage. Um, as you all know, uh, Russian regime forces kind of have the last little bit of Idlib kind of bottled up and there are you know, uh, tons of refugees there that can go flooding across the border, causing a big headache uh, for Erdogan uh, if Russia decide, decided to dial up the, the violence there. And then for Erdogan, well, we're seeing it uh, right now, um, you know, links with uh, Zelensky and Ukraine are definitely a good way to kind of stick in Putin's crawl, whether it's selling drones, you know, other military technical cooperation, uh, you know, free trade and the like. Um, in general, uh, Erdogan can kind of uh, balance between Russia and NATO. Um, for example, if there's a, an invasion of Ukraine, um, you know, a, a bigger Russian uh, military presence there 
um, Erdogan can you know, look to the NATO for additional support. Thank you, John, for reminding us once again that if even when and if Turkey would like to pivot away from Russia, it's not an easy task and Putin has a few cards up his sleeve. And let me now turn to Anya. Again, a million dollar question for you, Anya. What would be the smart course of action for the United States and other NATO members to take in Ukraine? What is the smartest way to push back against Russia? And do you see any constructive role Erdogan can play as part of this NATO game plan in Ukraine? Sure, uh, great questions uh, as always. Well, I, I think the, the biggest lesson that we can draw from what is happening right now in Ukraine um, is that the West for too long has, um, has been too complacent and uh, presented itself uh, as too weak. Uh, what's happening now, um, it, it's, not, it's not happening out of the blue. It is happening, um, it, it's a result of years uh, of, uh, of, of actions that Putin read as weakness and uh, on the part of the West. Uh, even if uh, the West may not necessarily have intended it that way, it, this is ultimately about perception. And specifically just in this last year alone, um, two key things happened. One is the Biden administration lifted sanctions against Nord Stream 2, by the way, against bipartisan outcry um, in Congress. Those sanctions were the one thing that um, halted uh, Russia's main geopolitical project in Europe, that is Nord Stream 2. Um, and the second uh, was the absolute debacle uh, of how we, we withdrew from Afghanistan. And you could see from uh, how uh, Putin personally and other senior Russian officials have uh, taken full uh, advantage of this and played up the narrative of the failure of American credibility globally. Um, and um, so the way to uh, the way to push back most effectively is to deter uh, Vladimir Putin. And the hard lesson here is deterrence uh, cannot be devoid of hard power. Um, we are now uh, seeing uh, uh, increased deployments uh, to, to Poland. Uh, and to other parts of, of Eastern Europe and so forth. And that's a, that's a really important step. Uh, I'd argue it's very much overdue. Um, I think the question is, how are these troops gonna be positioned? Uh, what, will, what form will this determined state, the deterrence take place with regard to high power? But I think that's, that's, where the, that's exactly where the key lies. Uh, along with that, we should be playing up our narrative. We've been in, we, had a, we have a very serious uh, narrative problem. We've had it for a very long time. Uh, and again, here, the Kremlin had no problem uh, with, again, from the Kremlin's perspective, if you look at what they've done, it was basically what we would call a whole of government approach. It was everything as one package with hard power, uh, uh, propaganda, cyber uh, attacks, cyber warfare. Uh, you're talking about the all elements of statecraft being deployed. Um, Whereas we mostly focused on diplomacy and sanctions if Putin invades uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, rather than e even here we could have enacted sanctions earlier. But I, I still I think if we if we finally now at this very critical stage um, learn that uh, learn that lesson um, and we put Putin in a position where he's it's it's a lose lose for him. Uh, it, you know if you see you see a lot of um, commentary right now saying that Putin has backed himself into a corner. And one of the big debates right now, even among military um, experts, experts of the Russian military or military overall, is whether or not Putin has put himself to a point where he has no choice but to act uh, militarily, because otherwise, if he doesn't, it'll look humiliating, it'll look weak. Um, I'm not sure if he's reached that point yet, but he could, if we finally play our cards right th th at this very late uh, stage, uh, stage. And again, what we need to do is discredit him. Um, and we haven't done that yet, especially because the Russian narrative on this issue um, domestically has been all about being defensive and not wanting to go to war. If you look at Russian polling, for example, by the most trustworthy uh, Russian pollster, the Levada Center, you're seeing uh, a perception formed among the Russian public that it is the West that is putting Russia to pushing Russia to war, which Russia does not want to fight. Um, so the idea that uh, um, uh, uh, a retreat might necessarily be humiliating, he hasn't quite reached that point, but but he could, and that's what that's what we need to be doing. Um, 
can Erdogan uh, uh, play um, a, uh, a, a helpful role? And this is, you know, this is a very tough question because uh, ultimately, if you look at how uh, how Erdogan has handled himself, uh, um, uh, he has not been, unfortunately, uh, a good ally, even as his frustrations with Putin quite clear, clearly are real. And it all goes back to, again, how Putin has set up all these forces of, of leverage against him. And, and the other arena there is, is the South Caucasus, by the way, um, and Libya. Um, and so uh, the question is, uh, can we compel, again, Erdogan, can we compel him uh, to be more helpful? I think here the issue would have to be compellence as opposed to uh, incentives. Um, and perhaps that might, perhaps perhaps that might still be an option. I also uh, remain uh, as John and Sanan more on the pessimistic side because I think when dealing with countries like Russia uh, and Turkey, that is probably a more prudent uh, approach. Um, um, but I do think again, I do think if we finally relearn some of our Cold War lessons, um, maybe we can still. Uh, come out of this if we realize what a dire situation we're in. We're talking about a fundamental revision of uh, the US-led post-Cold War world order. It's a world that brought us an unprecedented era of peace. And if the United States loses its leadership position, um, you're talking about a return to an incredibly unstable and dangerous world that we used to have. And, and that's, you know, I hope there is a realization that that's not a world that we want to return to. Sinan, I think you would like to follow up. Yeah, just a comment um, and, and a question. So the comments were, uh, and it's just to, to sort of latch on to what John was articulating. It's an interesting question of, you know, what what can what leverage does Erdogan have over Putin? I think I ultimately fall on the side of saying that he doesn't have enough leverage basically to constrain any Russian action should Putin decide to act because, you know, whether it's military or diplomatic or economic terms, the Russians have the upper hand, ultimately. That being said, um, I think one of you touched upon it. I can't remember if it was John or you, I can, but this drone business uh, that the Turks have developed and deployed and tested and utilized in, in two notable theaters is the biggest worry that I can you know, sort of raise with anybody interested, which would suggest that Turkish drone capacity has proved to be highly effective and caused significant damage, particularly in the Nagorno-Karabakh war in undermining Armenian uh, military capabilities. Uh, and also in Libya, uh, basic, uh, very much at, uh, counter to the Russian support, uh, supported fighting forces. So that, that is something that the, the Russian military is probably likely keeping an eye on. But again, that being said, if, if, this, the, if, you know, if, if, if that was Erdogan's main chip, I'm sure the Russians uh, uh, have something to counter that, in, in mainly in the realm of whether it's cyber attacks or uh, any other sort of military deployments to basically render Turkey ineffective should this conflict go ahead. So something just to pay attention to. Um, the question, or a couple of questions for Anya actually, um, I agree with everything she said. Um, do we think this is also a pivotal moment, um, if I may ask this? Um, you know, one of the things that the US seemingly could do, um, sh you know, in addition to or independent of lending military assistance in any substantive manner to Ukraine, should an invasion happen, um, is this not a golden opportunity to, for, the, for the Biden administration to really press its thumb in really backing the development of the European Defense Initiative once and for all? Um, something that the Europeans uh, became more aware of under the Trump administration, uh, the pursuit of strategic autonomy, mainly because they cannot rely on the United States to have their back all the time. But this seems to be a golden opportunity. And we know that the Germans aren't necessarily on board. But this seems to me at this point, given what you're highlighting in terms of the very present da real dangers that Russian, Russia presents at this point, this is the one sort of time where, um, you know, uh, Europe could very much sort of follow, go down further the road of integration in the realm of defense and foreign policy, because I don't think there's a clearer motivation to do so. I mean, it's, it's, we shouldn't be undermining this. So that's the first question. And the second one is, um, well, it's not a question. Um, yeah, I would agree with you. At this point, a colleague of mine recently just basically said today that an ounce of prevention is probably more effective or an ounce of deterrence is more effective than for trying to deal with the fallout of a nuclear, uh, not, sorry, not nuclear, but a military invasion incursion. That seems to be, you know, that's unbreakable. Uh, sure, Sanan, thank you. Um, thank you, that great question. And, um, you know, I must admit I hadn't considered it at length, but now that I listened to you speak, I think what you described makes a lot of sense. 
Um, I think what it comes down to is, will the Biden administration muster enough willpower uh, 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 to do this? I think that's really the key question because uh, if we look at what happened with Germany again with Nord Stream 2, it seems that the reason why uh, Biden ultimately lifted um, the sanctions was because he wanted Germany's cooperation on China. And he believed that in order to be a good ally, this was, this was a way sort of to be a good ally, uh, if you will. I, I think this was incredibly flawed, um, especially because China of all countries is watching very closely what's happening right now uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and how we act here is very much going to uh, matter for how China acts vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Um, but I, I, I agree with you. I think that's an excellent point. Frankly, I think maybe we should be uh, making it uh, uh, making it more. Um, and it's your comment also about deterrence being worth uh, a lot more than you know than a pound of cure. Of course, uh, the, the issue here too. Keep in mind that. The reason why this is such a this is so dangerous also is because um, if you look at how the Russian military is conducting itself, how the Russian military doctrine has evolved, they've studied us. They've, uh, they've studied us and they've fundamentally restructured how, their approach uh, to conflict. And if you look at how they handled Syria, um, this was a, a primarily aerial campaign with a, a, limit, a very limit, a small naval component and a small contingent of ground troops. Um, and so when, when many, many commentators uh, thought that Russia would find itself in a quagmire in Syria, uh, we all saw uh, quickly uh, that the, 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 the Syria campaign was designed precisely to avoid a quagmire. And if Putin goes into uh, Ukraine of, uh, and Russian um, military, um, th there's a long history in Russian military uh, thought that every conflict is, is unique. Uh, there's no size, one size fits all. But um, what they will attempt to do, I think, if they go in is they will attempt to do it quickly with limited casualties. Um, and it's all going to be over uh, before you know it. So uh, uh, the, the issue is not whether or not there's going to be a, a full, con a very you know prolonged conventional war, but whether or not they're going to move in really quickly and re really uh, grab certain chunks of Ukraine and re and render it paralyzed. That's incredibly dangerous. Okay, now uh, we're about to move on with some journalist questions. Unless John, would you like to respond to any of the comments? I think I'll, I'll save it for later. Okay. So Sinan, you, it's, it's great that you brought uh, the drone issue once again, because now as we turn to a few questions from our journalist colleagues, uh, we'll touch on the drone issue. In fact, Anya, uh, let me begin with you. We have a question from Elizabeth Cook, a freelance journalist based in Ukraine with bylines in foreign policy and The Guardian. And she asks, how is Turkey's growing drone diplomacy likely to affect its relationship with NATO? And will it tip the balance in its relations with Russia, given how key a role Bayraktar drones played in Nagorno-Karabakh and can potentially play in Ukraine? Uh, great question. I'll try to answer it as best I can because my knowledge on this issue is, is, is somewhat limited. Um, it, it's clear that uh, that the Kremlin is not happy with, with this drone issue. It's, 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 it's an irritant. It, it's a very big irritant. Um, uh, I, I think it's ultimately going to come down to, again, um, because uh, as John and Sinan had mentioned earlier, ultimately Putin doesn't have as much leverage, uh, sorry, Erdogan doesn't have as much leverage over Putin. Uh, eventually, the, the Kremlin might find ways to push back uh, against this in a way that, that hurts Erdogan. I think that's, that's the way it's going to go down kind of uh, in broad strokes. Now, would you like to weigh in as well? Sure. I, I would just say that in terms of the Ukraine conflict, uh, yes, the, the TB2s do give um, Ukraine some additional capability that's you know, significant in the Donbass um, against the Russian-led proxy separatists. However, when it comes to, to going against Russia's own military, um, uh, the full strength of Russia's military, the, the TB2s will play no significant. In fact, they'll probably be destroyed while still on the runway um, if, if, Russian, uh, if Russia does end up moving on Ukraine. Um, so that, that's, that's just one point. And, and the second, I'd say that you know, Turkey is very good with its, uh, like you say, drone diplomacy, um, you know, taking the videos in the Nagorno-Karabakh war 
uh, Libya, et cetera. Um, but I, I would just caution against viewing this as some sort of you know, uh, major shift in the balance of power uh, between Russia and Turkey. Uh, you know, Russia itself has been making strides in, in this area um, after you know, historically lagging behind. Um, in terms of you know, Turkey's relationship with NATO, I'd say that, that it could be a, a bright spot. Um, we've seen, I believe, you know, reports of, of uh, potential contracts with Eastern European countries for you know, drone capabilities. So that, that's some, some way that Turkey could make a positive contribution to the alliance. So now let me turn to you uh, with a second journalist question. Uh, we have one for you from Shebnam Arsu, a Turkey-based correspondent with bylines in the New York Times and Der Spiegel. And she asks, a recent survey indicated a growing public expectation for the Turkish government to improve relations with Russia and China instead of the country's traditional allies, the European Union and the United States. What is your reading of this finding? Is this about the Turkish government's strategic preference to establish a mutually beneficial relationship with Russia or a natural outcome of Turkey's alienation by the West? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I suspect the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Um, I, I haven't seen the data that this is drawn from, but I'm uh, not, not to doubt its veracity. I'm just, you know, I just haven't seen it, but it, it makes sense from a whole number of perspectives. First of all, the sort of discourse that's been pushed by Erdogan um, and his government, at least since the coup attempt, if not longer, but particularly since the coup attempt, really relying on the demonization, delegitimization, and alienation of Turkey uh, from it, the United States, its Western partners, uh, and the and the, the presentation of, of of the European Union and the uh, and the U.S., particularly in pernicious terms, as sort of hostile to Turkey, has really trickled down into the mindset of the ordinary Turk. Um, I'm sure you, you know your colleague who asked the question, Shebnam, uh, as well as many sort of independent journalists that are very familiar with what's going on in Turkey. That if you sort of you sort of watch, you know, observe a lot of these street sort of interviews with the average citizen, when asked why Turkey is in such a dire economic or foreign policy situation, there is no shortage of individuals that voluntarily just say uh, Turkey's been undermined on purpose by the West, George Soros or CIA-led plots. Um, and this is very much in line with um, other proto-authoritarian, quote, nationalist populist regimes, uh, not least of all in, in Hungary, Poland, but also in places like Venezuela or Brazil, uh, where similar narratives of delegitimizing sort of uh, the rule of law uh, 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 governments and international sort of observers seems to sort of reinvigorate and shore up the baseline of, 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 of domestic voters. And so it doesn't surprise me that, um, you know, that, that, that is a perception on, on, in the mind of, of most Turks. Whether it's a strategic preference of the Turkish government, I, I, I would hold off on that simply because, not because I necessarily disbelieve it, but simply because I think the Turkish government lacks strategy um, or, you know, a, a strategic discourse of any sort of, uh, you know, traceability at this point, right? The, um, I recently came across this sort of snippet of, 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 of um, uh, you know, um, non-attributable information that suggested that the present Turkish ambassador uh, very much thought in Washington, that is, uh, Ambassador Marjan, who was appointed quite recently, seems to believe that Turkey's position and, and, and ability to sort of work with the United States will be much better and all problems will be resolved if Turkey makes nice and gets and remends ties with Israel. And if you think, what's the relationship between the two? I think it's based on an understanding or the supposition that, the, the, that, uh, that, that there are a certain number of Jewish or Israeli intellectuals or financiers or government personnel that influence and control the United States government and, it's how, it, and, and how it perceives Turkey. So this is the kind of mindset that we're, I think, working with when sort of seeing how Turkish officials and Turkish government sort of behaves. I don't think it necessarily has a strategy of where its strategic interests fly, um, because if it was Russia and China, it wouldn't make sense from a perspective of strategic you know, pivoting. Neither China nor Russia possess the economic capacity to bail Turkey or uh, economically out of its current malaise. They're not interested necessarily in investing and basically working with Turkey for any prolonged manner. Um, this is something, and, and Turkey's trade and economic ties and business ties, whatever you want to call it, people to people diplomacy, 
none of this is historically grounded in these two realms, but it's conversely, you know, rooted in Europe uh, and, and, and the United States, it's strategically uh, under the NATO umbrella. So um, if there was a marked shift in sort of more sort of militaristic and diplomatic alignment with, with Russia and China, it's not through as a result of strategy, it's, it's more a reflection, I think, of sort of um, uh, uh, just foolhardiness, uh, not necessarily a uh, well thought out plan. Sinan, some argue that Erdogan's strategy is fence sitting, that is leveraging one block against another block to maximize his or Turkey's uh, you know, gain. Uh, do you agree that this is a viable strategy or this is a strategy? That's a really good question. Uh, I was going to raise my hand, but then I forgot uh, 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 an emerging senior moment in my aging years. So <laughs> um, yes, uh, it, it, it is interesting from, you know, for, for one particular perspective. I th I've been thinking about this. For Erdogan to move substantively in concert with its European partners, concerned European partners and allies, as well as NATO over the Russia issue presently, I think he needs to be given a reason, right? What I mean by that is there needs to be decisive action, whether it's military, diplomatic, or a, co or a confluence of both on part of NATO and the United States, right? Uh, to act decisively, there has to be a clear game plan for Erdogan to essentially weigh in on that. That would be my first point. Uh, a sort of divided Europe or a divided NATO in terms of what do we do about this? Should we just wait around if there is an incursion, sort of a model response? I wouldn't be surprised at that point if Erdogan just sits this one out. What is in his interest to sort of really push back against that, knowing well that Turkish agricultural imports to Russia could be stopped within a day? Um, you know, uh, the, that would be crippling already. So that would be one. Uh, two. I think it would also it would be in his best interests, as he conceives it, that in return, even if Europe was you know united uh, with NATO to pushing back strongly against Russia, what does he get out of it? Right. So I think that he might be sort of interested in horse trading and bargaining, and that's not outside the realms of Turkish sort of diplomatic trading in the past. You know, Turkey made largest demands of the United States prior to the 2003 Iraq invasion to the tune of demanding 80 to 90 billion dollars of offsets. <laughs> Um, simply because it was going to be saddled with a, a pretty nasty sort of, you know, but, you know, cross broader trade sort of uh, climb down. So, you know, I think there are two components to that as far as I can see. But initially, you know, if there is not a clear consensus of what is to be done against Russian either deterrence or actual post invasion, I think Erdogan more than willing to just sit that one out. Um, Thank you, Sinan. And uh, John, the last journalist question we have is for you. Uh, from Mindy Belts, an independent journalist who until recently was the senior editor of the World magazine. She asks, why do you think the United States, as the de facto leader of NATO, has been unable to rein in Turkey's cross-border exploits and pivot toward Putin? Can you describe some of the leverage points the United States could apply, but has been unable or unwilling to? So the, the first question is a good one. Um, I, I guess I can give my perspective and perhaps seen on one of uh, smarter things to say about it. But you know, as, uh, as we discussed in our report, uh, you know, for, for Erdogan, um, it, I think his goal really is sort of an independence from the West. He does not want to you know, remain just you know, a part of the Western alliance. He wants to kind of have, you know, reassert uh, Turkey's role within his region and, and sort of be an independent actor. In terms of you know things the U.S. can do, um, you know tougher CATSA sanctions, uh, you know for, for Turkish arms purchases from Russia, um, you know really uh, getting serious about you know confronting the, the democratic backslide in Turkey, I think would be something we should absolutely do. Um, that could take the form of global Magnitsky sanctions. It could take the form of you know joining with European allies and calling out um, the Erdogan regime for cracking down on human rights activists and the like. Nania, you are an expert on dealing with autocrats. Do you have any suggestions that you can, you know, import from U.S. policy toward Russia to U.S. policy toward Turkey? Oh, well, I completely agree with what, what John said. Um, I, I think, you know, the only thing I have left to add is when it comes to dealing with autocrats, again, it, it all comes down to pressure rather than incentives. 
Um, and what John described is, is, is a type of pressure. Um, I, I think, you know, the other key uh, issue is that both Erdogan and Putin seem to be uh, quite happy with the role Erdogan himself plays at NATO as a wedge. Um, and this, this presents a big problem for us because, um, uh, uh, because um, we, we don't have a lot of tools uh, to change this, this dynamic. And I think that makes, that makes both of them uh, very happy uh, because Turkey essentially would have to vote itself out of NATO. It's not gonna do that. Um, and so uh, I think it, you know, employing all elements of pressure um, would be the way to go. Is there any ideas about how to push back? No. <laughs> um, but I would just to, to follow up on Anya's point here, um, you know, uh, one of the concerns that's put out there suggesting a strong European response in concert with NATO, or, or, right, seems to fall back on the notion that it's not an ideal time for European nations because they're be beleaguered by COVID or economic hardships, uh, downturn in sort of GDPs, whatnot, and a variety of inflationary pressures. That's understandable. But I would just say to sort of reinforce Anya's sort of you know, moment of this is a moment sort of, 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 of action, right? If we think back to the eve of World War II, no European state was in an ideal position to take on Nazi Germany, not really, right? It's, I, I would very much push back against the notion that we're somehow going to reach a plateau of economic stability and growth, whereby a whole bunch of European states, as well as the United States, can be saying, well, OK, we're, we're in a good position now. Yes, we can push back against Putin, against Putin because we're, that's not how things work, right? And Putin is keenly aware of the divisions and the weaknesses in European economies. It's not something that he has to deal with. He does not care if the Russian economy is in a precarious position. He's not accountable to the electorate in, in, in the ways that, that, that his sort of adversarial counterparts are. Um, so this is something that European government should weigh in notion of, within the realm of there is no ideal time other than to push back against this in a very forceful manner. Uh, so in, in a language that he understands. Otherwise, um, I think he finds a way to, to make those sort of land grabs to possibly establish that land corridor. Um, and something else also, you know, how the United States is positioning itself. You know, if we take it back to the Imamiyas and leading from behind over Syria as a sort of responsible way to undermine ISIS, as a, you know, in, a, in opposition to putting boots on the ground and significant troop commitment, we already know that's not the American way anymore. Uh, there is a huge amount of reticence, both militarily, uh, but also just ideationally. You know, if, if Obama and, and, and Biden, quote unquote, can be deemed the sort of strategic thinkers about the US position in the world, I don't think they're interested in committing you know, tens of thousands of troops to this. Uh, the Trump administration also made it very clear saying they weren't interested you know, in, in countering Russian aggression, right, uh, for one reason or another. But it's precisely because of this um, that the European states in NATO should volunteer to take the lead in this, even if they're not military as capable as the United States, with the United States lending military hand. You know, there is not the appetite in the U.S. military or the DOD or the U.S. government writ large to, op you know, to, to open up a new front. And, and basically, you know, to jump on what Anya said earlier on, the Chinese are watching, right? Yes, the Chinese are watching mainly from the perspective of, you know, what does that mean for us for Taiwan strategy? Sure. But it would be China's golden dream at this point if the United States was to engage heavily in a military conflict with Russia. Because all that has to, Russia has to do is sit this one out, you know, for the Chinese to sit this one out and continue to grow economically, look at the chessboard as it's evolving, it would be another sort of conflict that the United States is militarily engaged and stretched in again. Um, and that is not something that we want. So it really, the, you know, it, from the way I look at it, is it, it can't just be limited to a 2% increase in the limited defense spending of NATO members. It has to be, what can we do to lead, take on a leading role uh, in the defense of Europe, in a, re in a reality whereby the United States is really not interested in doing this or doing the heavy lifting in this militarily. I think it's a golden time. Anya, would you like to follow up? Yeah, just, you know, this is such a great point that Sinan made. Uh, I just wanna really underscore because it, it, it captures something really critical uh, about the time that we're living in. Uh, exactly as Sinan said, 
uh, there's never really the right time. There's no, there's no right, uh, there's hardly ever a time when conditions are right for anything. Uh, and you can't just think in life and anything that unless there's a perfect time, I'm not going to act, right? Um, and uh, in Europe, exactly, as, as Sinan said, uh, on, uh, with the rise of Nazi Germany, uh, the, uh, Europe ultimately was able to pull itself together. What really concerns me is that because we had so many decades of peace and prosperity that we've gotten so comfortable uh, and complacent that we forgot um, how tough the world really is. And it's a very hard lesson to relearn. And I hope we don't pay the ultimate price, price to have to relearn that because we spilled so much blood uh, fighting for, for this better world for freedom. If we lose that, um, it means we, we, we forgot that lesson again. And, oh, John. Yeah, I would just pick up on, on Sinan's point about you know America being stretched in kind of two different directions with China and whatnot. Uh, just to, to add that, like we said earlier, you know. An ounce of, of prevention is much better than the alternative. So, uh, you know, I think Putin absolutely did see uh, the U.S. and Biden saying hmm, we need to focus on China, COVID climate, et cetera. You know, maybe for, from Putin's perspective, maybe now is a great time to, uh, you know, with the U.S. distracted to kind of press my claim. I, I think that, you know, as much as we need, do need to focus on China as the number one threat, we have to realize that, you know, uh, just like with withdrawals from Afghanistan, et cetera, making that move out of Europe can only kind of pull us back in into something that's much more costly in the long run. So again, an ounce of prevention, maintaining deterrence, you know, providing Ukraine with weapons, actionable intelligence, you know, standing strong with allies in, in NATO, I think can ultimately save us much more resources and time and energy to focus on China uh, in the long run. Thank you, John. And now let's wrap up this webinar with my favorite part, which is the lightning round. So I will ask each one of you uh, a question and I will expect you to give me a one sentence answer. And I know that's mission impossible. Anya, let me begin with you. Where do you expect Russian troops to be as of March 1st? Well, uh, if we successfully deter Putin with hard power, it is possible that we will see those troops retreated. If we do not, we can very well see Russian troops uh, ha having had a, a staged a small but very decisive incursion into Ukraine, and that's an incredibly dangerous precedent. Thank you. And Sinan, would Erdogan's Turkey join any Western sanctions against Russia? It depends. <laughs> that's a short <laughs> sentence. <laughs> um, it depends, comma. It, it it depends on whether there is concerted and decisive NATO and US-led actions that are clear, defined, with end goals in sight, that appears to Erdogan will very much make life difficult for Putin and enough for Putin to essentially backtrack from, right, should those be levied against him. That is the only way I think that Erdogan does this. Otherwise, sit it out, I think. Yeah. And John? In the unlikely case that Ankara joins Western sanctions against Russia, what would be Putin's strongest retaliation against Turkey? Well, you know, it could be the, the sanctions we mentioned earlier. It could be cyber, um, perhaps uh, Idlib boosting support for the Kurds in Syria. Um, and just to kind of give a smart aleck answer to uh, on this question, uh, we know that either way, Russian troops will be in Ukraine. This, of course, Crimea is Ukraine. Down that's always the safe bet. Yeah. Thank you, John. And thank you all for participating today and for your insights uh, on these important issues. And thanks to our audience for watching. For further insights into Turkish-Russian relations and how they might impact Ukraine, I recommend you to take a look at FTD's latest monograph, Collusion or Collision, Turkey-Russia Relations Under Erdogan and Putin, which I've had the pleasure of co-authoring with two of our panelists today. Sinan and John, and all three of us were also privileged to incorporate Anya's valuable feedback into the monograph since she was one of our peer reviewers. Thank you again, Anya, Sinan, and John. And for more information on FDD and the latest analysis from our Turkey program, we encourage you to visit fdd.org, fdd.org. We hope to see you again soon.